Alrighty, um, so, uh, yeah, this is interesting, uh, yeah, I, uh, I ended up, uh, yeah, I ended up finding this, this game here, um, it's called Crown of Leaves, apparently, um, it's, a apparently it's a visual novel, it's, a indie, 2D story, it, it has all the makings of a good game I'm seeing here, you know, a, a, a Rui, a resilient city dandy, a half-educated jeweler, and the artist, and the Arthur, I'm sorry, excuse me, of scientific magic articles, was met with a colossal failure and must return to his homeland of Latori. That's interesting, I mean, this game, um, looks beautiful, you have characters here, you have nice art, the artist is great. I mean, I mean, look at that. I mean, look at that. It looks amazing. I mean, come on now. It looks like a good time, you know. Uh, so uh, yeah. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna play this game. I'm I'm gonna see how it is. Maybe do a review on it. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. I mean, I mean, uh, it's nine times out nine times out of ten, it's just gonna be one of these, you know, like just a short story type thing, you know, uh, all that whatnot. Um. But I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's bound to be something that I'm going to enjoy about this. There's bound to be something I'm going to enjoy about this. Definitely. Definitely. It's hard. You ever play Nancy Drew? Maybe a Sherlock Holmes game on the old PC. Perhaps the Miss games on the Macintosh. Well, if you have, this will make explaining this game a little bit easier. Point and Click Adventure Games are a name of the game today and have been a staple during my early middle school days when I was at home doing absolutely nothing rather than just watching the same reruns of SpongeBob over and over and over again. My mother always had these on hand, mostly because of all the Goodwill runs we made from time to time. The Nancy Drew games were the most memorable that I had, while other games like the Sherlock Holmes title that I had was another one later on during my childhood. The genre possibly could have inspired my love for other adventure games with puzzles and the like, for example, the Professor Layton series, or even Phoenix Wright. Everyone in the comments say writer Crystal Rose is an Edgeworth simp. It'll make them very happy. Believe me, I know. I talk to them. I know how they think. So, with that being stated, you can imagine my surprise when I noticed a little title on the old gateway to furry filth, as some would say. What is this title, you ask? Oh. Oh, you didn't ask? Ask, motherfucker, right now. Ask, what, right, ask, 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 ask me right now, or episode 6 gets canceled. The Crown of Leaves, an indie point-and-click adventure, which was released November 26, 2019. The reception to the game, mostly from players, seemed to be very good, with many folks actually praising the game for its visuals and its story. Now, if you all know me, then you all know that I don't exactly follow what trailers and reviewers say. These motherfuckers can lie after all, and I'm all about sniffing out the truth. Thus, I had to give this a shot for myself. Being the guy I am, I had to make sure that I played this game to its entirety, so that also meant buying the second chapter DLC. Huh, maybe this will be like an extra ending bit to the overall story. Let's look at the actual creator though, and see what else they may have made. The developer is known as Lynn Grimm, and this game seems to be their only creation that could be tied to the gaming industry. However, they do have a Patreon and a Twitter, which is in the description if you're interested, and post there fairly regularly. Seems like the developer, Lynn Grimm, is even the one who is making the art as well. Yes, this artist is the developer and makes the wonderful art. Their Twitter, again, is in the description. Lingram, bro, this review is for you, my dude. I hope you have some fun watching this. Uh, that is, even if you are. And if you aren't, well, then that's perfectly fine. At least people will know who you are now. Well, more like know more about you because, god damn, look at all those followers. Now, without further ado, let's begin looking into the game, The Crown of Leaves, set in the Shangla world. Now, usually the game would tell you the setting and shit, but let me tell you about what's going on. Kinda like a summarization thing. 
You play as Rui, a 27-year-old, uh, goat, dog, cat thing? I don't know. Whatever he is, he looks goddamn adorable, though. Anyway, you play as Rui, who was forced back home after having a run-in with a mafia gang during his time working as a reporter for the newspaper. Due to this, he is forced back to living with his mother and aunt, as well as Saban, his aunt's son. This game opens to him working on a special bracelet, which is to be given to the Baron, who is proposing to the Baroness, which apparently is a very big deal. This is where you're tasked with finishing the masterpiece, but unfortunately, working with loud shouting is a bitch to deal with. And thus, your real first task is to get your aunt and mother to shut the ever-loving fuck up so you can work on this damn bracelet and stop procrastinating like a college student looking to reenact that one episode from Spongebob. Time's up, Spongebob. Now that that's out of the way, let's begin with the gameplay. What you see is what you get, it's a point and click adventure game. You have an inventory, a journal that details the events as well as people you meet along the way, and a quest menu. Yes, there are side quests, and they're not exactly difficult, they're just... Okay, best to explain that one later. You click around and finish your quests, with some needing items, and even items that have to be fused or put together to make new ones. It's nothing groundbreaking, but as they say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. As you progress through the game, however, you'll find that the puzzles and things you need to do become more challenging, which will make you think outside of the box to figure out what to do. Some puzzles will even make you feel stupid because the way to solve them is right in front of your face, but because you're overthinking it, you completely forget what to do. Happened to me quite a bit in my playthrough too. Motherfucking flowers, I hope you never get another ray of sunshine again, damn bastards. Clicking things will also give you a bit of information on the setting, with some things being tied to the situation on hand, so make sure you click and read everything. This is also how you'll find side quests that you can tackle as well. They're not required, but they don't take too much time either. And that's the gameplay, really. What more do you want me to say? It's a point and click puzzle game, where you have to follow the story, find items, and figure out what to do. Not much else to it. That's not to downplay the game, far from it actually. The way the game looks and feels is very interesting, and I was enthralled by what would be in this world and the backstory that was hidden within it. Speaking of backstory, let's talk more on the story itself, since that is where folks will find themselves coming back to. Now then, is the story interesting? Let me put it to you like this. I don't want to hear nobody say that this shit is not as complicated as Kingdom Hearts because you have no idea what's happening during a specific point of the game. Let me paint a picture for you. You get called over by your friend Lander who works for your aunt, Brilla. He needs you to get rid of this one plant that for some reason looks like a sheep. It apparently ate all the plants and you have no choice but to go and dig it up. You do, you take it away to the forest which is apparently like a maze. It for some reason starts talking to you, and you bury it. Okay, weird opening, but nothing I can't handle. This is a fantasy world, so of course there's going to be a strange group of things that happen that then go together to make this sort of situation that you have to deal with, that you may have to save people, or you may die because of it, and all that whatnot. I mean, that's, that's kind of natural. I can get used to this. I see this. I eat this sort of shit in my sleep. Okay, yeah, no, that doesn't happen. How about you black out and find yourself in some sort of party where these strange creatures are celebrating what is essentially your birthday? What? What the fuck? Okay, that's not fair. Let me explain this a bit more so that it's easier to understand. What's happening is that Rui ends up running into a party where the folks celebrate the day that the selected person is fated to die. It's basically a birthday. This place is called The Flat, and it's where the Tsurai, immortal beings, reside. However, mortals can't go too deep into the flat, or they risk being sent back into the mortal realm, also known as the stream apparently, aged beyond what they originally were, with some being completely aged to dust. So yeah, Rui is a bit worried here. It's here that we meet Bo and Flynn, who seem to know Rui, but he doesn't know them. 
The more that they tell him about things, it seems like he's regaining memories. Memories about something called the Crown of Leaves. But the thing is, they don't seem to be his own memories. However, that can wait though, for there is a celebration to be had, and during the celebration and merriment, Rui gets multiple presents, like a camera, and it gets killed by Flynn. Well, that's some present, my guy. Wow, um, how about next year you twist my balls and eat my pancreas too, because apparently this is the type of presents you like giving to your friends, you jackass. We then enter our second protagonist of the game named Karom, who is trapped in the same setting, being the party that Ruri died in. Strangely enough, it's completely void of life and looks abandoned for years now, with everything completely absent of any color. The only thing around is an eerie black darkness and an inky liquid that could be seen filling a piano. The ink, however, is so dark that stars can be reflected from them. Perhaps the stars are even inside the blackness as well. This is where another puzzle comes in. By using a specific item, which is known as the Star Theater, you can decipher constellations. To do this, you'll need to turn each ring to a specific point, just until you start hearing a melody at its peak of volume. Do it right for all three rings, and you'll find a completed constellation where the puzzle will be completed. This is generally the MacGuffin of this section, where multiple puzzles are solved using this. As you solve each puzzle, you find yourself in another room, where you'll run into a projector that somehow is able to make constellations into real life objects. Damn. Can, yo, can you make me a PS5 while you at it? And what object pops out? This object is... Rui? Wait, so Rui was the one that the constellation was supposed to be and what the projector decided to spit out. Why? And how? We don't figure this out, but we do figure out something that was going on. In truth, what Rui was seeing was not something that was technically happening to him, but was instead something that had happened to Karom in his past. This makes him believe that Rui is actually a doppelganger of himself, but that theory is thrown out the window when we realize that Rui is unable to use the Star Theater, whereas Karom can without any sort of problem. With tensions high, however, they find their way into the darkness where a single building rests. They enter it, and what do they find? Why, a dead body, of course! Okay, uh, Lingram, buddy, uh, can we talk for a second? Yeah, yeah, please, just just for a second here. Uh, come here. I love your art. You do a wonderful job, my guy. But goddamn, you gotta tell me how you could draw this stuff without getting shudders and body chills and shit. I'm not even mad. I, at this point, I'm just in, I, I'm, I'm impressed. We then look further into the building and find pieces of a photo that Ruri took of Flynn and Bo, as well as a room with a strange inky dragon. Apparently, the master who owns him is the dead body upstairs, but who is he? Well, throughout the game, you find out that Saban's father, Umbrilla's husband, was actually close to Karom. His name was Milosh, and he was tasked with watching over the slow, which is the black ink that we see. He waited for years for the day that Karom would finally be reborn, and in his final moments, he was able to tell them the final bit of information that he needed. In truth, now Ruri and Karom are linked, meaning that if one of them dies, the other does too. Basically, it's like Bread and Fred, except you both better be on the same page, because if you fall, you don't just go you go This is also where we find out that Karom was in charge of saving everyone. Unfortunately, he can't do it without a partner, and since Milos is dead, Rui is the one who has to help him. Reluctantly, the two decide to forge onward and find their way back to the surface. They do, of course, but not before Karom gets his leg bitten into by a strange creature. Luckily, they were saved by a single woman named Juniper. Juniper? Uh, Juniper? Uh, I, I, I'm, you know what, I'm just gonna say Juniper because that's how it's spelled. Okay, before I go any further, though, again, I, ju I just want to say something else. Lingua, buddy, real quick thing here. Can you, can you come a little closer, please? I, I need to talk to you one more time. Come here. T come closer. Closer. Step back. One more step. Now you're a little too far. Come come closer again. Half a, a baby step forward. Perfect, right there. 
You're fucking me up here. Why is it that everywhere I go, there's some sort of waifu in my mist? Juniper, Lazy, this one mystic that I can't remember the name of, Maristall, who I know is a dude, but I'm gonna put here anyway because this dude's got some gorgeous ass eyes, and even Emerald and Prilla! These two women are old enough to be fucking grandmas! Why are you making me into fucking goofs, my guy? God damn it, dude! You're too dangerous to be left alive! But... Uh, what, what, what were we talking about again? Oh yeah, uh, Karom and his injury. Since the two are linked, if he bleeds out, Rui, our homeboy here, dies. So, now it's a race to try and patch him up, and thus Juniper gives him a list, to which he goes to find everything. Complete a few puzzles, meet some people, get shocked by Saban, and you find yourself at some sort of show. This is where you meet a mystic named Maristal, who Rui sees as a scam artist. <laughs> I mean... Is he wrong though? Look at this fucker's face. There's no way he's not evil. Fucking looks like a such a bottom two. Even I could probably dominate his plump ass. Anyway, somehow he ends up getting challenged by this guy, and it comes out that the Baron doesn't actually exist. Only the Baroness does. Thus, people believe that the Mad Rook, which is basically an urban legend that people seem to believe is real due to the fact that misfortune happens in that town, and so they blame the Mad Rook, and uh, now it's gone from pranks to people actually getting hurt, was the one who already played a prank on him, as well as trying to harm the village citizens. They even, somehow, connect the dots to make it seem that Rui was the cause of everything, and thus, is fucking banished. And then... Nothing? Wait, why did it boot me back to the main menu? I I I'm clicking chapter 3, but it won't let me in. Did I fuck up somehow? I gotta look this up. Oh, okay, I see now. I I I that makes sense. Okay, I get it. So, apparently, this game is episodic, meaning that episodes come out later as DLC. Similar to games like Benny and the Ink Machine or Telltale Games. Because of this, we have no choice but to sit and wait. Not to worry though, I'm sure it won't take long. How long did it take for the second chapter to come out? Shouldn't have been that long. Three years. It took three years for it to be released. Bro, please, I'll do anything to help. Anything to make the next chapter come out faster. I'll write dialogue, I'll do pre reading anything. Just please, don't give up on this masterpiece. Safe to say that this story has me by the balls. Okay, now that the story is completed, for the most part, what are my thoughts and feelings about this game? Well, let's start with the things I liked about it. First of all, the art direction is so fucking good. Like, holy shit, this artwork is amazing. Character designs are varied while staying true to the fact that most of the characters are part of the same race, which apparently is called a Sahash. Not to mention, again, all these furry waifus. I, I mean, pick your poison at this point. Every one of them is just... Mm! Including this guy. The backgrounds and settings look wonderful as well, with some conveying a soft, gentle feel to it, and others conveying an eerie, almost dangerous feel to them as well, such as the flat and its monochrome color palette. The menus and text boxes also have an almost Star Watcher or Constellation theme, which plays in tune with the Star Theater and the Constellation puzzles as well. The music and soundtrack is great too, with tracks that'll make you feel many emotions. Yes, I bought the soundtrack as well and I'm listening to it while I write the script. This is gonna become a running thing with me, isn't it? Puzzles in this game are also thought-provoking and fun, with you having to figure out who to talk to, how to solve the puzzle, and what to put together to make the specific item you need. Of course, you could always just click everything and hope that works, but unfortunately for you, brute forcing it is going to be painful and slow, so don't even try. The Star Theater is also a pretty neat puzzle type as well, but it may grow a little bit stale if the puzzles either don't get harder, or if new things aren't added to it. Nothing too big, just little things to spice it up a bit, like maybe something else that needs to be accounted for during the puzzle. The game also gives you the choice to skip the puzzle if you can't figure it out. Just press the spacebar. So, pretty neat in my opinion. Lastly, the story. The story is possibly what drew me in the most. 
It may seem confusing, even with me giving a synopsis to the best of my ability, but it's actually not that confusing to understand if you pay attention to the context clues. It just sometimes feels like a lot of nouns and words are thrown towards you sometimes, without exposition as to what they mean. Again, though, it's easy to understand, if you're paying attention. Story is at least better to understand than fucking Drakengard. Like, what the fuck is even canon with this game? Now, are there things that I don't like about the game? Well, to be honest, not really. The most I could say that a person may be a little off by is all the nouns and verbiage that is thrown at the player. Though, you can look into the journal to get more info. Reading this, you'll be able to understand. Everything is detailed, even with how the world works and with detailed definitions and descriptions to each word. In other words, there's a bunch of lore in this game, and if you enjoy games with lore, this will be the perfect game for you. It's honestly amazing how much effort and time is put into creating this world, and how everything works, and even the way that the, the different mortals and the different immortals work. I hope that my stories and world can be just as amazing as this one right here one of these days. The only other thing I could complain about is basically the fact that the game is still not complete. Yes, I know that the game takes time to make and I'm not rushing, but I do wish that this game was completed so that I wasn't sitting on my thumbs waiting for the game to be completed and so that I wasn't sitting in anticipation wondering how our boy Rui was going to get out of this bad situation. However, they are working on this diligently, with them posting bits and pieces of their art on their Patreon, as well as some small announcements on their Steam page and Twitter here and there. Again, all the social links will be found in the description below. The Crown of Leaves is, in my opinion, an amazing game with a story and world that has been meticulously planned and created, with so much to learn and understand. The puzzles are in no means just fodder, with players having to really think and put their theories to the test, as well as think inside and outside of the box. With wonderful and beautiful art, an amazing gameplay loop, fitting music, and a story that literally has me by the balls, this game could be one of the point and click indie games of Steam. Rating this game as is, I'm going to give it a 9 out of 10, only due to the fact that it's not yet complete. I can't give it a perfect 10 out of 10 until I see the full vision of what the creator and the actual developers have in mind. However, when this game is completed, and I will be waiting patiently for the remaining DLC Lingram and the Broken Horn, we will come back to this game and review the rest of the story, then this game could possibly even skyrocket to a perfect 10 out of 10. It all depends on how the story comes together and what they introduce to the players. For now, however, if you guys want to check out this game, you won't be disappointed. And if you want to help the creator and the people working on the game, check out their Patreon. I'm sure they'll all absolutely be thankful for your time and support. Now then, if you all excuse me, I need to have a little talk with someone that I met a few moments ago. Apparently, she's a bit of an ice queen, but I think I can warm her up. Hello? Miss Brilla? I wanted to ask if you wanted to go on a date or something? If you're worried about me accidentally breaking your hip, I promise that I'll go slow. <laughs>